Okay. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the board game Go. I'm sorry to all of you who are hoping for Go Lang discussion here. And uh, also some of the progress that has been made in artificial intelligence and trying to get computers to be as good as humans at Go. So first I'm going to tell you a little bit about the game. Then I'm going to teach you how to play. And we'll talk about a few things that come up in the game that make artificial intelligence for Go difficult. And then take a look at the state of the art and progress that has been made uh, in the game. So Go has three names. You may have, you probably haven't heard of the others, but Weichi is the Chinese name and Paduk is the uh, Korean name. Uh, Go came here from Japan, so most people in the U.S. call it Go. It's around three or four thousand years old, and it's the oldest game that's still played in its original form. Uh, it was one of the four accomplishments that were required of Chinese gentlemen uh, or back in the day. So you needed to be able to do calligraphy painting, you needed to be able to play the lute and play Go. Uh, so after this talk, you'll be a quarter of the way there, at least. Uh, in Japan, the shogun Tokugawa uh, established four Go schools around 1600. And uh, each of those schools was supposed to work on the game, try to perfect the game. And then once a year, there would be a large tournament called the Castle Games. Uh, it wasn't large in terms of people. Each school was allowed to send one representative, but uh, it was a big deal. And the winner of the Castle Games got a cabinet-level position in the government. So there was a lot of incentive to... Uh, improve at Go, and this is where the Go skill really started to uh, blossom, I guess you could say. And then in the 1900s, uh, it became possible to make a living playing Go. In Japan, a uh, professional system was created in the 20s, and uh, newspapers started offering large prizes for tournaments. Currently, the best uh, you can do at Go if you win a large tournament is win half a million dollars, so not too shabby. Uh, professional systems were established later on in Korea and China, and it's more popular there now than any game is in the US. This is a recent street fair in Korea, and you can see there are a few people who know how to play Go on the street there. Uh, I think there were about 500 players, and you can see the people in the middle wearing the yellow sleeves are professionals that were there, so they're all playing something like eight or 10 simultaneous games against passersby who just stop by and play. So what is Go like? It is a two-player strategy game, something like chess. There's no hidden information or randomness. Usually we play on a 19 by 19 board, but there are two smaller sizes that uh, are used to teach beginners or just for a shorter game. And the basic goal of the game is to surround territory. Um, also within Go there are rankings and a handicap system. So uh, you start out as a beginner, you start out around 25 Q, so down here at the bottom. And, uh, and then you progress upwards, so you can go 24Q, 23Q. Not all the ranks are shown on this uh, chart. And once you get up to 1Q as an amateur, you switch to 1 Don, which is basically like a black belt. And then uh, you work your way up to 6 or 7 Don. Uh, so you can see on the left here the EGF rankings. The European Go uh, Federation uses numbers instead of the uh, rankings. And those correspond roughly to ELO ratings. So if you're familiar with chess ratings, there's something like that. Um, once you get to the strongest amateur levels, then there are professional levels above that, and uh, those are not the same distance apart. So you can see uh, the third row from the top here, there is um, 2,700 is the rating, and that's a one Don professional. And then the top professionals in the world are nine Don, and the difference in ranking points is only 240 there. The, the difference in rankings is determined by the number of handicap stones that a player would need to take. Um, playing against someone stronger or weaker. So if you're three ranks apart, um, then the weaker player would start with three stones on the board and then you'd be able to have a good game. That's actually one of the really cool things about Go is that you can play someone who's quite a bit stronger or weaker than you and still have a good game. That And it doesn't really change the feel of the game very much. Uh, in chess, it's kind of hard to do that. right? If you're 400 points weaker than somebody in chess, they're going to beat you every time. And you can try something like spotting them, you know, a piece or the queen or something like that, but that sort of changes the game. You're not really playing the same game anymore. So in Go, you can, uh, you can start with a handicap, and it still feels the same way. So this is what a finished game looks like. Uh, your pieces are actually played on the intersections of the board. That's a, a common beginner thing. Almost every other game we know, you play in the spaces, but Go, you play on the intersections. And the idea is to surround space. Uh, the way it works is that players 
put a stone on the intersection on their turn. So you add a stone to the board, and that's it. The stones don't move around. They can be captured, so if they get completely surrounded, you can remove them from the board. Uh, but they just stay in place once they are added. All right, now I'm going to teach you the game. There are only three rules. One is the rule of capture. So any stone on the board has breathing spaces next to it, or liberties. And you can see the liberties are marked on this diagram. So the stone in the corner has two, stone in the middle has four, and actually stones that are connected horizontally or vertically have, uh, uh, am I still there? Firefox is in the process of crashing. Yeah, you're still there. Okay, well, I'll try yeah. to keep going, I guess. <laughs> okay, so um, stones in the, that are connected horizontally or vertically are uh, sharing their liberties. So this group of two stones on the right here has six liberties, and the one at the top edge has four. So those stones will live or die as a group. And I can't go to the next slide because Firefox is dead. I will be back. She's only six, so maybe next year. We're starting with assembly. <laughs> Good man. Don't wait till they the ground up. <laughs> no. You gotta start from the bottom. Be happy she's not flipping electrons. <laughs> I feel really pressured to talk now. Hmm. Oh, so fun fact. Um, the Long Island Go Association president and like lead instructor, his name is Milton Bradley. He's a very nice man. He has no relation to the game company. I don't know. Possibly. All right. I am back. Sorry about that. Can you give me uh, control again? Do you have control? I don't know. Let's see. I don't know. There's no presenter. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tim, what's your ranking? Uh, I'm around one or two done. Wow. So Sweet. I've worked my way up there, and I'm, now I'm stuck. I've been stuck for about three years now. <laughs> All right, let's see. Can you see this now? Uh, Not yet. Yes. yes! Okay. So uh, if you fill the liberties on the stones, they are captured. So here are some stones that are almost captured. This is called being in Atari. Uh, it's kind of like check and chess. So if it's Black's move, Black could capture any one of these four groups on the next move. And uh, that actually is where the name of the game company Atari came from. Nolan Bushnell is a big uh, Go fan. So if it's Black's move, Black could play on the last liberty for any of these white groups, and then whichever one he played would disappear. He obviously couldn't play all four of those moves at once. Um, so these stones would be captured and removed from the board, and each of those stones is worth a point at the end of the game. If it was White's turn when White got into Atari, then White could play uh, another stone connected to the ones that are in danger and gain more liberties for them. So he could extend out of Atari and try to get away. Um, so you can see the stones on the top edge here each now have two liberties, one to the right and one below the last stone. And the ones in the middle that have extended each have three liberties now. So it's going to be harder to capture those. All right, so that's rule one. Rule two, very simple. 
you are not allowed to commit suicide. So white cannot play any of these four points because it would cause the stone just played to die. And then the third rule is the rule of ko. Ko in Japanese means eternity, and this is to prevent infinite loops in the game. So if you have a shape like this in the game, black can capture a white stone. And so if he captures that white stone, now you're in the symmetrical situation, and white could recapture and take us right back to where we started. And that is not allowed. So we can't have infinite loops. Uh, the simplest way to state this one is just to say that the whole board position cannot be repeated. So after black captures the white stone, white cannot recapture immediately. White has to go change something else on the board, and then on his next turn he could come back and capture the black stone. And then that actually leads to some complexity that we'll see a little bit later on. That's it, three rules. You can capture stones by surrounding them, can't commit suicide, and you can't keep repeating the same position over and over. So you're all ready to go play Go now. Uh, the scoring is based on the territory that you've surrounded. So the way the game ends is that both players pass. You will get to a position at some point where playing in your own territory will be bad because you'll be filling up your own points that you have surrounded. And playing in the opponent's territory will be bad because the stones that you play in their territory will end up getting captured. And so there's nothing productive to do, and at that point you pass. And then uh, if the other player passes, the game is over. So you count the spaces that you have surrounded are each one point. So all of the empty points here with the white and black squares on them are a point each. Um, and then uh, the black group and white group in this diagram that have the squares on them are dead. So the players at the end of this game, this is actually one of my games, at the end of the game, uh, we agreed that the black group in the upper left there was dead and the white group in the lower right. Um, and if you, if you disagree, do you just continue playing? Yes, that's right. There, there are some extra rules. I didn't really tell you all the rules. There are some rules to handle that, disagreements on life and death, and also uh, there are some rules about some weird edge cases that come up in 1% you know, of games. Can you explain what you mean by dead? Well, I will explain that, but I'm not going to tell you yet. <laughs> Besides suicide, yes, you can play anywhere you want. That is correct. And you're right. If there are still empty spaces, then, uh, yeah, the stones don't come off the board, but they could still be dead, sort of. So this, uh, this white stone here uh, on the left in line 8 uh, is actually dead because there's nowhere for it to run but it doesn't come off the board until black actually finishes surrounding it. So black wouldn't normally do that during the game because it would be a wasted move and go is all about efficiency. You really want to make as much progress as you can with each move. So at the end of the game, here we've got a black territory in the lower left and in the upper right and in the lower right, and then we've got some white territories. We would count the empty points. We would also take the agreed dead stones off the board, and each of those is worth a point for the player who captured them. And then uh, we add that all up, and white gets six and a half extra points, which are called Comey, and that's because black has the advantage of going first, so we're compensating for that advantage. And then whoever has the most points after that wins the game. Okay, so the rules are extremely simple, but there are some interesting things that come out of them, uh, one of which is called a ladder. So here we've got a situation where white has some stones that are almost surrounded, uh, he's got one liberty left, and if it's white's move, white could try to run away. So white could extend the stones. Now he has two liberties. But in this kind of shape, black can play Atari again, and then white can try to run away again, and black can play Atari again. And you can see where this is heading, right? Well, white's going to run into the wall, and then he's not going to have anywhere else to run. So these white stones will eventually be captured. Uh, a few moves from now, it will look like this. And white has one liberty at D19 up here, and if white plays on that point, he will still only have one liberty, and so the stones will get captured on the next move by black. So if you have a ladder like this, the stones can run away for a while, but then they'll run into the edge of the board and they will die. Things get a little more interesting if there's a white stone in the way. So in this case, we have a white stone along the path of the ladder, and that's called a ladder breaker. So this ladder is not actually going to work for black. If white starts running away, uh, black can make him zigzag back and forth a few times, and then white will connect to the ladder breaker, 
So at this point, it's actually black's move. Uh, white is just connected to the ladder breaker, and now black has some serious problems. The, the two points marked with circles are big weaknesses for black, and black only gets to play one stone. So black can only fix one problem or the other, and then white's going to play the other point. And both of these circle marked points are going to threaten two black stones at once, and black will again only be able to save one of the two. And so white is actually going to bust out of this ladder, and then all of black's stones are going to be in trouble. So you really only want to play a ladder if it works. It's very, very bad to play a ladder that doesn't. And we'll see where that's important a little bit later on. Okay, you wanted to know about stones that are alive and dead. So here's, here's what that actually means. Here we have a white group that is completely surrounded by black and has one liberty in the middle of the group. And if it's black's turn, black is actually allowed to play in the center of this group. So when we play the black stone, the black stone that was just played and the white stones will not have any liberties. Uh, but first we will remove the opponent's stones before we check to see if our move was suicide. So we're allowed to go ahead and play here because the white stones are going to die, and then that will give the black stone breathing space. So this is possible, but if white has a group that looks like this, there's nothing that black can do. All right, since um, white has two liberties, and either of those moves would be suicide for black, there's no way to ever capture this white group. Okay, so this is where, um, where life comes from. If you can get two eyes for your group, then your group will be alive. And so there are situations like this where white has a group that is almost alive, and it depends on whose turn it is. In this case, if white plays in the middle, white has two eyes and the group will live. If black plays in the middle, white can no longer make two separate eyes, and so this group's going to die. And then with larger groups, uh, you'll have situations where you don't actually play it out. So this white group actually has two points in the middle that, it, that white could play on to make the group alive. And if black takes one point, white will take the other. So this is actually the most common situation. You'll have a group that's big enough that it can make two eyes no matter what black does. And so experienced players won't try to kill this group. They'll just know that it's alive and leave it alone. All right. So let's talk about artificial intelligence a little bit. Uh, here are a few games and how we're doing it, creating AIs to beat people at them. Tic-tac-toe, obviously trivial. Checkers has 10 to the 20th uh, positions, and the AI strength is perfect. In the last few years, Chinook is a checkers program that now plays perfect check checkers, and they did that by actually evaluating the entire game tree. And uh, so they know that Chinook cannot be beaten. The best you can hope for is a draw. Uh, Othello has more positions, and AI is superhuman at Othello. And then we have uh, chess and two types of Go. So 9x9 nine nine Go is the Go on a really small board that you would sort of start out as a beginner or just play to have a quick game that lasts maybe 10 minutes. And uh, it has 10 to the 38th power positions. And computers are now competing with the best people. Uh, chess has a f more positions than that. And as we all know, uh, chess computers are better than humans. And then 19 by 19 Go has an enormous number of positions, so 10 to the 172. And the best computers right now are at the strong amateur level. So I'm almost good enough to beat the best computers that run on a single uh, machine. Chess AI, uh, you would think, would work pretty much the same as Go AI. The games sort of superficially seem the same. You're going to take turns making moves. Uh, the way that Chess AI was approached is through tree search, of an evaluation function and alpha beta pruning. And that's how the first Go AIs worked as well. So how does that work? Well, we can look at any uh, chess game as a tree of possible board states, right? We have the initial state at the top, and then we have a branch down from that for each legal move. And then from each of those positions, we have more branches for the legal moves uh, from there. And we make some gigantic tree that has every possible position. And we can search within that tree to fi find uh, good moves and moves that lead us to good situations and bad situations. And so what we can do then is look at all of the possible positions that we're going to, uh, that, that moves will lead to, and we try to evaluate them. Okay, so we look at a position and we decide if it's good for white or for black. And uh, this, basically you get a positive number if it's good for white and a negative number if it's good for black. So this happens to be good for white maybe. I may have that backward. All right, so anyway, uh, chess AIs could evaluate the board, 
and then uh, then you take your tree and you basically chop off branches that lead to bad positions for the computer, right? You you make moves that avoid those branches. So you can prune the tree and then analyze the parts of the tree that you're actually going to allow to happen by making good moves and uh, try to find a path to a winning position. So Go AI started off doing this. There were there were basically two approaches at the beginning. There's sort of um, opening book where there would be sort of standard openings uh, that were programmed into the computers. But in Go that doesn't work very well because the opening probably lasts, I mean the standardized openings might last 15 or 20 moves out of a 200 or 300 move game. And uh, you know that's just not a big advantage. And then uh, there was some pattern recognition stuff done for small positions. But then beyond that they basically attack the problem using tree search. And uh, one of the big problems with that is that the branching factor in Go is much higher than in chess. So in chess, on average, there's something like 45 legal moves. And a game lasts for about 50 moves, so the tree isn't that deep. In Go, there are, on average, 250 legal moves, and the tree is 300 levels high instead of uh, 50. So there's a much larger number of positions to search if you want to make tree search productive. But that's not the only problem. Um, actually in Go the board gets more complicated as the game goes on so one of the things that's nice about chess is that when you get to an end game position depending on what pieces are left you, it can just be a solved problem so you can have an end game database that just says you know this huge class of positions all result in a win for white and if you can reach one of those in your tree search you don't have to do any more work but in Go actually as you get closer to the end of the game the game gets more complicated so that is not helpful um, another thing is it's hard to prune branches. You can't even do things like, say, if a move leads to the opponent capturing a large group of stones, then we're going to ignore that branch because even sacrificing large groups of stones can be a good strategy. So throwing those options out is not really a good way to get a strong program. And then the biggest problem uh, is that evaluating a position is difficult. So in chess, it turns out it's not that hard to have a simple rule that does a pretty good job of telling you who is winning the game. So a big piece of that is just which pieces have been captured, right? Which player still has more pieces on the board. And uh, in Go, it's much, much harder to look at a board position and decide if it's even good for white or black. Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple of the reasons for that. So one of the big reasons for that is Go has a large board, right? So there are 361 points. And you would like to be able to break that down into pieces and analyze the pieces independently because then the computer can sort of play out all the possible moves in that area that makes sense and decide who's going to win a fight in a small area. But it turns out that you can't do that because of some non-local effects in the game. So we've already seen one of these, ladders, uh, and a ladder can result from a, a complicated fight. So here in the lower right corner we have a very simple ladder, but you can imagine a fight where a bunch of different groups of stones are fighting for liberties and trying to capture each other. And then at some point, uh, that fight results in some group of stones running away that is caught in a ladder. So that ladder can actually go all the way across the board. And that fight then depends on results in a totally different part of the board. right? So the computer may decide that this fight in the lower right depends on the ladder. Well, now any move that white makes in the upper left corner of the board affects that fight. So you really can't take pieces of the board and analyze them independently when you have something like that happen. There's another problem that makes this even more difficult, and that is the co-rule. So here we have a black group that is on the edge of being alive. If it's black's turn, black can uh, fill in this point, and then black has two separate eyes, and so black is alive. If it's white's turn, white can capture that single black stone, and if white can get another move in this area, white will then capture the three black stones on the right, because they are now in Atari. Um, because of the co-rule, black cannot recapture white stone immediately, right? So black can't take us back to that previous position. So what black has to do is find a threat somewhere else on the board that white will answer, and then after white answers it, black is allowed to come back here and capture the stone. And so this fight, deciding the life of this group, uh, can rely on threats throughout the board. So black needs to find a threat. This, this capture, uh, this group living or dying is worth maybe 25 points. So Black needs to find a threat somewhere else that's worth 25 points, and then if white answers the threat, black can capture the co, so we'll go back to this position. And now white will try to find a threat that's worth 25 points somewhere. 
and if black answers that, white will recapture. And so this can go back and forth for quite a long time using threats from all over the board. And then finally, either black will win and connect and make the group alive, or if white wins, white will play another move here and capture the three stones, and then uh, black's group is dead because it's only got one eye left. So Ko is another, another issue. Uh, Ko fights can arise, and then the computer to figure out what's going to happen with a single group in a small area has to actually analyze threats from the entire board and try to figure out what's going to happen. I'm getting depressed. This is making me not want to write a Go AI. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, what is the state of the art? So we started off with tree search and trying to make the evaluation functions better and prune the tree, basically take the same approach as chess. Um, that worked okay up to a point. That got computers somewhere around the 10Q level. Um, then there was sort of uh, a breakthrough, and Go AI started to use Monte Carlo tree search. So what we do with Monte Carlo tree search is we take a move, a candidate move, so these moves near the top here are candidate moves, uh, these leaf nodes that are marked, and what you do is you play games out from that candidate move, but you don't use a smart AI to play the rest of the game because that's way too slow. What you do is you basically just play the moves out randomly from that point to the end of the game, and then you see who won the game. And you do that over and over, and then you keep stats back in the candidate move node about how many of those games were wins for black and how many were wins for white. So it sounds kind of counterintuitive that this would work at all. It seems like you know, it would just be playing lots of stupid moves and it really wouldn't, uh, the results wouldn't really be affected much by the move that you're trying to evaluate. But it turns out this works really well. So you can actually play a whole bunch of stupid moves and see who wins and then do that you know, thousands of times. And that will actually give you a pretty good idea of how good the move you're considering is. Um, so that actually turned out to help quite a bit. And then there's another modification that's been applied to this recently called UCT. And what, what they do there is rather than evaluating each candidate move evenly, UCT tries to figure out which moves are better and uh, which moves are likely to be worse. One of, one of the problems with the original Monte Carlo tree search is that it would look at moves that it thought were good and spend a lot of time on them, but there might be a move that it it's kind of an, a surprising move that turns out to be really good, and it would not evaluate that move enough to find out that it was good. And so UCT tries to balance that out and give a decent amount of analysis to even moves that initially look bad. And so that was a further refinement. And then just a few weeks ago, there was a paper published on a new neural network approach to Go, and this looks extremely promising. They, they took a neural network and they trained it on 160,000 professional games, and then the way that this neural network works is it just looks at the current board. It doesn't look at the history of the game or anything like that. It just looks at the current state and predicts where the next move will be. And uh, just doing that actually gave it a workable AI. So it, it beat uh, a version of GNUgo that is about 7Q, and it beat it 90% of the time. So that's, that's actually surprisingly good because this approach is not using any of the other work that's already been done. So once this is merged into the existing techniques, uh, it seems like it'll probably be another jump in strength. All right, so here is the history of uh, progress. The chess programs definitely got off to a better start. Uh, Go was pretty bad up until about 1990 or so. And then there's sort of a hockey stick effect over here on the right um, that uh, is where the Monte Carlo tree search got to... Uh, uh, start started being used. And so we have a much steeper slope after that. There's been a lot of progress in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, so if you look at the uh, list here on the left, in 1998, pros could beat the best programs, giving them a 25 stone handicap. That is a truly absurd handicap. I think that probably none of you sitting there who just heard the rules for the first time, I don't think I could beat any of you with a 25 stone handicap. And if I could, I could do it one time and then the second game you would annihilate me. <laughs> All right, 25 stones is a huge handicap, so there was a gigantic gap uh, between the best programs and the pros. Then around 2008, a uh, program beat a pro for the first time. So Mogo, running on 256 cores, beat Catalan Toronto on a small board. So that's on a 9 by 9 board, which is a much easier task than on the large board, uh, but still impressive. And also that same year, Mogo running with 800 cores beat a nine don professional with a nine stone handicap. So this is on a full size board. Um, 
And then in the years since then, the handicaps have been getting smaller and smaller. So you can see down here at the bottom, in 2013, Crazy Stone beat a 9 Don Pro on a full board with only four stones. All right, so that is a, that's an impressive accomplishment. And then this year, Crazy Stone beat another 9 Don Pro with four stones, but won by a wide margin. So it's looking like maybe the difference is three ranks now uh, between Crazy Stone and, and uh, some of these top professionals. So it's actually getting close. They're starting to breathe down our necks. Um, it looks like we'll probably see a, a computer that can compete with the best professionals in the next 10 or 15 years. And then at the end, I have some links if anybody wants to read more. All right, let's see. There were some questions over here. Okay, yes, Jacob, I agree. It seems like the game would get less complex, right? Uh, the problem is that usually when a position is resolved as alive or dead, it doesn't get completely resolved in strong players' games. So if you actually played it out, and beginners tend to do this, so beginners will will uh, see a group that may or may not be alive, and then they'll play enough moves in that area to be completely convinced that it's alive or dead. They'll they'll physically take it off the board, or they will, uh, you know, beat on it until it actually forms two eyes and it's clear that you can't do anything to it. But in professional games you actually wind up um, leaving things hanging, right? You'll have a group that's close to alive or dead, and the professionals know that right now that group is alive, but they don't want to play near it because it might make it stronger. And maybe if they can cause a fight in that area, they can play a move that will threaten two things at once. And so the group will, you know, either they'll have to sacrifice that group that could have been alive, or they'll have to sacrifice something else uh, in the game. So. Uh, the stronger the players, the more they tend to be juggling things and leaving things up in the air until the very end of the game. And that means that up until move 200 or so, the game tends to get more complicated. And then the last 100 moves are not so bad. That's the end game, and that's, that's easier for a computer to attack. Uh, there are a few good places to play online. Uh, there's a site called KGS that has a nice Java client and uh, has a lot of players on it. There is another server called IGS that has many clients. They have an open protocol, so there are lots of different clients for IGS. So you could play that on your phone uh, or basically any platform. Uh, those are real-time servers. There are also some turn-based servers, which is what I tend to do because I usually don't have an hour to sit down and play a whole game. But I'll you know, have a few minutes to spare here and there, and I'll just go play moves in a few of my games. So I mostly play on Dragon Go server, um, which has a crappy PHP implementation and the UI is not so hot but there's a pretty good Android client that I wrote for it and uh, there's actually an iOS client out there too um, which are you know pretty decent for playing on there uh, I don't think we have one on the remote games board but we should we should set one up we could actually create a Fog Creek tournament on Dragon Go server and, and just start a bunch of games if anybody wants to <laughs> I think we have one question yeah. here, Tim. Okay. So, uh, tree search and, and general search algorithms are certainly criticized by me, and I'm not alone, as not being AI. Uh, <laughs> okay. And one could argue that this uh, 160,000 node uh, neural net for Go is one of the first really legitimate AI approaches to making this happen. Although the Monte Carlo methods also have some, some interesting concepts. Where, where are you? Yeah, that's Pardon me? Where, where are you in that struggle for what actually constitutes AI versus just an encyclopedia of opening and closing moves? So, so one of the ways this started, when it started back in the day with chess, is that uh, people thought chess was something that you could only do if you were intelligent, right? right? And so if we could build a computer that would play chess like a human, we would have real intelligence. And so then when, uh, when they used tree search to do it and they started beating the best humans, Everybody said, well, that's not intelligence. You know, that's just, that's really simple. What, you know, that, that doesn't count. Uh, I guess I kind of feel like that's going to keep happening. So at, as we find more techniques and we uh, maybe make go beat humans, it may become clear how that works. And then we'll say, oh, now we understand that. That doesn't seem like intelligence. I don't know if, uh, if it's going to be so easy to pin intelligence down. It seems like eventually computers are just going to be doing uh, the same things that we can. And I guess I would say that what intelligence really means is we can't explain how it works. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
there is a game called Arima that someone created, and it was specifically created to be hard for computers. Um, I don't know if that really counts because the game doesn't seem that interesting to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not something anyone played before. I guess there are people who play it now. They actually do have some tournaments and things like that. But uh, yeah, it's. Um, I think after Go is beat, that might be it for games, pretty much. At least for for games that were not created specifically to be hard for computers. Nope. <laughs> Would you say game over? Would you say a cloud nine? Um, there is a, a friend of mine who's a uh, who runs the AI lab at uh, at Columbia. Said uh, he saw a demo recently. People still uh, use the actual original Atari games. The set like the the console games, there are 79 of them, as uh, as AI uh, test beds. And he saw a demo. He, he's an AI professor, and he said, you know, none of this stuff. All this stuff is sort of incremental. None of it feels particularly like world changing. Um, and he, he said, I saw a thing the other day that made me think, oh, we're in trouble. And what it was was uh, the set of algorithms that these guys have put together, and it takes as its inputs the RGB values of the uh, of the Atari game's output. So three numbers per pixel. Just the pixels are the only input. Um, and it has the score, and it has it can do a joystick, and it can play these as fast as it, as it wants. Um, and within an hour of uh, being shown breakout, it is, uh, it is able to play the game. Within two hours, it's able to efficiently tunnel through to the top where you get the uh, all the bonuses. Uh, this algorithm, it's a single algorithm, and it's it has already bested the human scores of 59 of the 73, I think, uh, Atari games ever. So and it's the same struggling. set of algorithms. It's not detailed. No, yeah, it's not detailed for each game. It is just a, a generic algorithm. Um, you know, and like sub chaser or whatever, it knows to like stop and go to the surface and refill its oxygen and like, uh, it, and it, it doesn't know how, it just does it for anything. Do you know if it's like a genetic nice. algorithm or? Uh, I yeah. know that there's layers. Yeah, yeah it has a, so there's a YouTube fun. video on it. It's worth watching, it's really cool. Um, but there's some. <laughs> Have you guys seen the video? There's a video of something like that where uh, there's an AI that learns to play Super Mario Brothers. It's pretty much in that way. It, I think it basically only knows the score and that it wants to move to the right. And uh, and you can watch it sort of learn to play the game. It's pretty pretty cool. I'll try to find that and put it in chat. Can you put it in at like 5.30? <laughs> we can get another couple hours of work out of people. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Cool, I believe we are done then. Thanks, everybody. Send us up, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks, guys. Father gets so often a thought device in Korean.